my son looks at me and says, I don't want to work at Red Lobster. I said, Frankie, no one is making you work anywhere. This is just another opportunity that you're wasting. Okay, no Red Lobster. What's your plan? Oh, I don't know. I got frustrated. So I raised my voice. Well, you better start thinking. His mom didn't like that. Don't talk to him like that. I said, look, biscuit blocker. <laughs> See, up to this point, we have agreed on how we raise our son. But in this situation, she's trying to protect him from the world. I'm trying to prepare him for the world. If he cannot handle me raising my voice to get his attention to see the bigger picture, he's not ready for a world that doesn't care about his feelings. Good morning. It's Tuesday, Trump Tuesday, January the 23rd, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the patriotic song of the day, we will have news shorts, patriotic shorts, motivational shorts, Bishop Barron, Ayn Rand, the 33 strategies of war, and the second half of Trump's State of the Union address from 2018. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I shouldn't change, the courage to change the things I should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you. And now the news shorts. Iran fired missiles at what it claimed were Israeli spy headquarters near the U.S. consulate in northern Iraq last night. The U.S. condemned those strikes, which heightened regional tensions as Israel continued its attacks against Hamas militants in Gaza. NBC's Richard Engel reports from Jerusalem. Last night, there was a mysterious and potentially very provocative attack carried out by Iran into neighboring Iraq. It was announced just after midnight by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, generally known as the Rev Guard, which is a, an elite division of the Iranian military. It's considered a terrorist organization by the United States and, and, other, and other governments. And it was a ballistic missile attack fired, uh, a ballistic missile fired from Iran into the autonomous Kurdish region, which is in northern Iraq. And a fireball could be seen for miles. It exploded in a very wealthy neighborhood of Erbil, not far from the U.S. consulate. And many people initially thought that the U.S. consulate was the target and that this was part of the widening war, this widening proxy war between the United States and Iran. Uh, but Iran then announced that what it did uh, attack, and this was confirmed by uh, Kurdish uh, reports and Kurdish media, was the compound, the private compound of a wealthy Kurdish businessman who has a security and logistics company inside Kurdistan. 
And the reason Iran said that it targeted this compound, killing, according to media, the businessman himself and three other people, is they blamed him for coordinating with the Mossad. They said that his compound was a Mossad logistics and operations base, the Mossad, of course, being Israel's intelligence service. Uh, the United States, Israel, other governments seem to be trying not to escalate this further. The United States called it irresponsible but has not been uh, uh, has not been responding militarily does not believe that the U united states was the target that the target instead was this alleged intelligence headquarters by by the mossad in kurdistan that's richard engel with that story. all rise superior court is now in session a big decision on Monday that could impact the Fulton County election indictment happening miles away in a Cobb County courtroom. The secretive case of Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade's divorce, secret no more. A judge ordering its unsealing, marking the first time the case has been made public since February of 2022. There's very specific and stringent processes that the court must follow before a record is withheld from the public. And they were not followed in this case, Judge. Attorney Ashley Mergent, who represents election indictment defendant Michael Roman, said the case was sealed without a public hearing, invalidating its secrecy. It was Roman's legal team who first floated the allegations of an improper relationship between Wade and his boss, District Attorney Fonnie Willis, earlier this month. After urging from Willis's attorneys, a judge said he'll wait to hear Wade's deposition in the case before deciding if Willis has to comply with her own subpoena for her testimony in the divorce. Wade's bank statements released on Friday showed the two traveled together to California and Florida while Wade was acting as special prosecutor. His wife's attorney outside of court said this wasn't an attempt to smear him or Willis or to tamper with the election indictment. It wouldn't matter who she is and what position she holds. If she's having an affair with my client's husband and he's spending my client's money on that relationship, I'm going to find out about it. And it has nothing to do, in my view, with her being the district attorney of Fulton County. Apologies for the technical difficulties on the front end of that. We also want to state that the next hearing in this case will be on January 31st, so we're not that far away from it. Also, at the state capitol today, legislators there announced a new special investigations committee, and they say their first task will be looking into these alleged allegations of an improper relationship at the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. So lots more to go on this. We're in Cobb County tonight. Doug Reardon, Atlanta News First. The road to the White House travels right through New Hampshire tonight as the Granite State holds its primary. The first six voters in the state cast their ballots at midnight, and all of them chose former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. Haley is hoping to make a strong showing against former President Donald Trump. Our political reporter, Jack Fink, joining us here in studio now with a preview. And Jack, what should we be looking for tonight? Well, Ken and Nicole, New Hampshire's state motto is live free or die. And tonight for Nikki Haley, it could be do or die. Some analysts say if she gets blown out by former President Donald Trump, it will be nearly impossible for her to continue. But they say if she's close within single digits, she may have some momentum to head to her home state of South Carolina and beyond. Chaos follows him. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley got the two-person race she hoped for as the major alternate. It's unelectable. To former President Donald Trump. Since he won the Iowa caucuses by about 30 percent last week, most of the major candidates dropped out. First, last Monday night, tech billionaire Vivek Ramaswamy announced he was suspending his campaign and backing Trump. Then former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchison said he was dropping out. And two days ago on Sunday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis backed out of the race and endorsed Trump. Most Republican leaders are now behind Trump. Since the Iowa caucuses, Trump has increased his lead over Haley in the real clear politics average of polls. From more than 13 percentage points to now more than 19 percentage points. And the most recent polls taken after DeSantis quit show Trump leading by as many as 27 percentage points. Ambassador, how are you feeling? Feeling good. Feeling Still in a campaign memo today, Haley's campaign said they have a shot in her home state of South Carolina and Michigan, along with the 16 Super Tuesday states, including Texas, that have open primaries where not only Republicans can cast a ballot. Over in the Democratic primary, there's an interesting dynamic. It won't count this year because President Joe Biden wanted South Carolina, which rescued his campaign in 2020 and is more diverse, to be the first primary for the Democrats on February 3rd. 
The president didn't register to be on the ballot in New Hampshire, but his supporters are urging Democrats there to write in his name on the ballot. Meantime, Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips of Minnesota, who is running a long shot campaign against the president, is on the ballot and is telling Democrats that the president wrote the state off, so don't write him in. And most polls in New Hampshire close in the next hour at 6 p.m. Texas time, though some close at 7 p.m. Texas time. State law allows results to be announced after polls close, so we will start getting results after 6 p.m. our time. We obtained surveillance video showing the shooter firing at the only surviving victim. CBS 2's Sabrina Franza spoke with that victim's neighbor, and she's live for us tonight in Juliet. Sabrina? Joe, that neighbor tells us that victim is out of the hospital. He's doing okay, but on crutches, he says, after getting shot in the leg. It was nine gunshots. That's a whole clip that he tried to load in this guy, and lucky that... It just didn't hit no vital organs. Curtis Ellis lives next door to the surviving victim. So I opened the door and I seen him hopping back up the stairs. It was like, man, I hope he's okay. In this video, you see a red sedan. Police say Romeo Nance was behind the wheel. He passes by once, twice, then starts firing. Hits this victim in the leg. For a guy of his stature that doesn't really do anything, it's kind of sad to just walking out on a Sunday and you can't even go to your car without getting shot. This after police claim Nance shot and killed members of his family on West Acres Road about 10 minutes away. Inside one home, police found four females ages 14, 16, 20, and 38, and one man 31 years old. Across the street, they found a 35-year-old man and a 47-year-old woman, all of them shot and killed. A three-year-old boy was originally unaccounted for. Police found him at a relative's home nearby. At the last stop, police claim Nance made before leaving Joliet to flee to Texas. We're told he shot and killed 28-year-old Toyosi Bakari, who was originally from Nigeria. He is not believed to be related to Nance at all. This guy wasn't messing around just shooting at people. He was trying to kill people. And while we're told Nance knew the seven victims that were killed inside the homes personally, police tell us that the other two shootings appear to be random. Live in Joliet, Sabrina Franza, CBS 2 News. All right, Sabrina, thank you. And that was the news shorts. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now, the patriotic shorts. This part of my face is below the patty dike, the rice patty dike, which is about 12 to 14 inches high. And this part is above the patty dike. And an NVA sniper then shot uh, two rounds into this helmet. Like, I thought it was one, but apparently there was two by the holes. And the only thing I felt was this and this. I said, goodness gracious. Good thing I had the helmet on. I got a big, I've got a big dump, a big, big lump here. And the radio operator looked at me and said, Lieutenant, that's not a, that's not a dent. That is a hole. And I looked at it. And uh, fortunately, it didn't do anything but just graze the scalp. Uh, you know, you talk about the power of a praying mother. My mother prayed for me all the time. And I do believe that's the reason I'm here today. So that day I was going to watch the doggone Sopranos with everybody. And as I'm going to the chow hall, I see this frenzied activity over at the operations center. And I walk over and they said ODA 574, which was the 18, 12 person 18 that was with Karzai's forces, just called. We've got mass casual. Jason Amarine is the team leader. You can tell a true leader because the more pressure they're under, the calmer their voice is. I hear Jason on the radio and Jason gives a situation report over the radio. Absolutely as if he was talking on the phone to his girlfriend. I got emotional, man. Still do. It's like, game on, man. He's like, we've been hit by a large explosive. They didn't know at the time it was a friendly fire. I've got three dead. Everybody's wounded. Boom, 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 boom. Just going down the list. Walked over to the tent. All the fellas are like watching Sopranos. I was like, get your shit done. Kind of see like team stars. Like, get your shit done. Let's go. The Army's new V-280 Valor tactical helicopter will soon replace their fleet of over 2,000 Black Hawks. But is it up to the challenge? Here are five reasons why the answer is yes. One, speed. 
With its tilt rotor configuration, the Valor can fly at a top speed of 305 knots, over 100 miles per hour faster than the Black Hawk. 2. Range. While the Black Hawk's combat range was a little over 300 miles, the Valor's is three times that. 3. Increased carrying capacity. The Valor can carry 25% more weight than the Black Hawk without sacrificing its speed. 4. Maintainability. Despite the Valor's advanced features, it's been designed to be easily serviceable in the field. 5. A state-of-the-art cockpit. Through a giant color touchscreen and advanced sensors, pilots will have unprecedented situational awareness that will even allow them to fly in near blackout conditions. If all goes to plan, the Army will have V-280 Valors in the field by 2030. A military parachute is designed for soldiers who need to jump from high altitudes and land in hostile environments. They are usually round or slightly elliptical in shape, and they have a hole in the center called an apex vent. So why does a military parachute have a hole? There are two main reasons, stability and maneuverability. A hole in the center of the parachute reduces the air pressure inside the canopy, which makes it more stable and less prone to oscillations or swinging. This is important for soldiers who need to avoid enemy fire or obstacles on the ground. A hole also allows allows some air to escape from the canopy, which creates a jet of air behind the parachute. This jet of air can be used to steer the parachute left or right by pulling on the suspension lines. This is useful for soldiers who need to change their landing direction or avoid collisions with other parachutists, but not enough to affect the safety of the landing. The two North Vietnamese MiG-19s came out of nowhere, taking the F-4 pilot and his wingman completely by surprise. The pilot, Colonel Handley, pulled up hard to get behind the enemies, positioning himself to fire the four missiles he was carrying. Unfortunately, the two AIM-7 Sparrow and two AIM-4 missiles he had were notoriously unreliable, and they all either went wide of the target or failed to even leave the rail. To make matters worse, the MiGs were now right behind the wingman, and Handley knew they could open fire at any moment. Having spent all four of his missiles and running dangerously low on fuel, he would have been forced to turn around if it weren't for one more trick in the F-4's arsenal. Flying at a speed of Mach 1.2, he let loose a three-second burst of fire from his Gatling gun, which ripped coin-sized holes into the side of one of the MiGs. He then watched it whiz past him in a fiery heap of debris. Having been forced into a desperate situation, he had scored the only supersonic gun kill ever recorded. Yo, the U.S. Navy and several commercial vessels came under attack yesterday, with U.S. Central Command saying that there were four attacks against three separate cargo ships in the Red Sea. And over the course of eight hours, the U.S.S. Kearney detected several ballistic missile and drone launches. A ship named the Unity Explorer was reportedly hit by a ballistic missile along with two other ships. When the U.S.S. Kearney was responding to distress calls, Central Command says they shot down several drones headed for the ships. And in addition to that, the Kearney also shot down a drone that was headed towards it. However, Central Command says that it's unsure if the Kearney was the intended target. And the U.S. says that Iran is enabling these attacks and they will consider all of appropriate responses and full coordination with its allies and partners. So follow to stay in the loop. He was in Hollywood less than two years when he received his big break. The lead in Kid Galahad alongside Betty Davis and Edward G. Robinson. He became an overnight sensation, starring in a dozen movies in the late 1930s alongside the biggest stars. His name was Wayne Morris, and it was while filming the movie Flight Angels with Jane Wyman that he learned to fly. Influenced by his friend Jimmy Stewart, Morris enlisted in the Navy before Pearl Harbor and saw extensive action in the Pacific. He flew 57 missions, shooting down seven Japanese aircraft and becoming one of the earliest American aces in the war. He also survived being shot down three times. Following the war, Morris struggled with PTSD while acting roles dried up. The former headliner was relegated to B-Westerns and bit television roles. In 1959, Morris suffered a fatal heart attack. He was only 45 years old. Wayne Morris is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. What would happen if the USA and Iran went to war? The US's strategy would change everything. Let me explain. First, American Navy carriers and Air Force strike groups, supported by Saudi bases, would unleash a massive air assault on Iran. Predicting this, Iran might launch ballistic missiles, but due to the advanced air defenses and help from the Saudis, the impact would likely not change anything. The U.S. Air Force would take out enemy air defenses, paving the way for rounds of strikes on missile sites, command centers, logistics hubs, and troop barracks. But an aerial strategy alone wouldn't be enough. To fully take control, the U.S. might have to consider a ground invasion, with one of the biggest challenges being where they would enter. Landing on the shores could be an option, except they still have huge risks. However, once on Iranian soil, the actual size of the country would make things difficult. 
Taking the entire nation could require a force of approximately 1.6 million troops. He had completed a four-year enlistment in the Navy and was living in Omaha when Pearl Harbor was attacked, and he re-enlisted the next day to defend his beloved country. He was Petty Officer First Class Charles Jackson French, and he was aboard the transport ship the USS Gregory when it was sunk in the early morning hours of September 4, 1942, as it returned from delivering a Marine Raider battalion to Savo Island. Searching for survivors in the inky black waters, French gathered 15 shipmates into a life raft, tied a rope around himself, and towed them for eight hours through shark-infested water, earning the nickname the Human Tugboat. I did what anyone else would have, said French when asked about his heroics. Sadly, French would pass away in 1956 at the age of 37. Charles French was put forward for the Navy Cross, but instead received a letter of commendation. In 2022, he was posthumously awarded the medal, and in 2026, an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer will be named after him. Two things almost nobody knows about the B-2 bomber. In a routine flight, a B-2 hit a Canadian goose that left a hairline crack on its windshield. The maintenance squadron looked for a replacement from the Air Force Parts Depot, only to find out that none were in stock. The spare windshields had been in the warehouse for so long that the company thought they were from a discontinued model of aircraft. So these forgotten windshields were sent to a program that sells old items to the public. Desperate to find them, the parts depot discovered that the windshields were sold all at once a few years ago. However, after a long search, the Air Force managed to locate the man who agreed to sell the windshields. The twist? He had used them in his daughter's treehouse. But that's not all. The B-2 set the record for the longest air combat mission in history in 2001. The Spirit, along with five other B-2s, went on a 44-hour mission into Afghan airspace, made a quick stop with engines still running, then flew back to Missouri, making it 70 hours in the air. And that was the military shorts. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, confuse them with your silence, shock them with your results. You don't always have to talk about what you're up to. Let your results speak for you. Let your actions speak for you. Social media doesn't always need to know about your grinding and hustle. People will know about it when they see your results. It's the one thing you can't fake. There's a lot of fake people out there talking a lot of crap about who they are and what they've accomplished. But one thing you can never fake is results. Be that person, the one who delivered, not the talker, not the statement maker, the result maker. Confuse them with your silence and shock them with your results. Under talk, over deliver. There's a saying build in silence. They don't know what to attack. Don't let the haters get a chance to attack you before you've done anything. Build in silence and shock them with your end result. You must know the results will come. If you get your head down and work, you do not need to tell everyone what you're up to or who you think you're going to be. Just show them the results will come if you get your head down and work. Your work ethic will show in your results. Your hustle will show in your results. Your ability will show in your results. Your greatness will show in your results. Never in your talk. There's no need to tell people how great you are. When you are truly great, they will tell you. Let your results speak for you. Let your actions speak for you. Confuse them with your silence and shock them with your results. Your work ethic will show in your results. Your hustle will show in your results. Your ability will show in your results. Your greatness will show in your results. Never in your talk.
And that was confuse them with your silence and shock them with your results. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now something a little different. NYPD radio audio in the Bronx. We got a 34 coming over at the intersection of Jennings Street and Prospect Avenue. Uh, by the job of advising male assaulted, six male Hispanics and male blacks, uh, took tools from the victim's tool belt and cut him in the face. Uh, female call state's perps are on the uh, basketball court. No uh, closing the script. Again, we got those Jennings and Prospect Avenue checking the rise. 14 to show you on the back. Uh, all we have at this time is uh, six male Hispanics and uh, male blacks. Uh, ringing the call back down to ascertain additional perp script. All responding units arrive live by 24. Here. Awesome. Toto, you on the air? On the air. 
Some type of description, I think, of the third one. T-shirt, has a green, neon green logo on the front of it. Gray shorts, multicolored sneakers. Alright, so it'll be advised. We're holding one on Chisholm and Freeman right now. The DVO? Chisholm and Freeman, you're holding one? To that. Um, 425, can you bring one, uh, the, uh, uh, witness for the show at Chisholm and Freeman? 104. Uh, DVO copy, uh, 42 Park is gonna be in the witness at Chisholm and Freeman. This is a key temp the description. Yeah, for, uh, Sergeant, the uh, description we have at this time, uh, first pair of black is 16 to 70 years old, red t shirt, black, uh, basketball shorts. Uh, second, uh, perpetrator is, uh, male black, 17 to 18 years old, white t shirt. Black shorts with blue stripes on the side, white sneakers with black trim. Third perpetrator is a male black, 16 to 17 years old, black t-shirt, green neon logo, gray shorts, multicolored sneakers. Uh, we're being advised that the DVO has one uh, possible stop at Chisholm and Freeman. Ready. Two ready. Elijah 93397. Hotel Bronx, a Bronx Club, a Grand Con, and Short Center, and then the Red Dabble. Queen 97, Henry, the Rock Bronx Club. Four on the Bronx. On the Concourse, 10 4. The Canvas 3. And that was the uh, NYPD first responders in the Bronx. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now the uh, Daily Laws for January the 23rd. January 23rd. Create a ladder of descending goals. Operating with long-term goals will bring you tremendous clarity and resolve. These goals, a project or business to create, for instance, can be relatively ambitious, enough to bring out the best in you. The problem, however, is that they will also tend to generate anxiety as you look at all you have to do to reach them from the present vantage point. To manage such anxiety, you must create a ladder of smaller goals along the way, reaching down to the present. Such objectives are simpler the further down the ladder you go, and you can realize them in relatively short time frames, giving you moments of satisfaction and a sense of progress. Always break tasks into smaller bites. Each day or week, you must have micro goals. This will help you focus and avoid entanglements or detours that will waste your energy. At the same time, you want to continually remind yourself of the larger goal, to avoid losing track of it or getting too mired in details. Periodically return to your original vision and imagine the immense satisfaction you will have when it comes to fruition. This will give you clarity and inspire you forward. You will also want a degree of flexibility built into the process. At certain moments, you reassess your progress and adjust the various goals as necessary, constantly learning from experience and adapting and improving your original objective. Daily Law Remember that what you are after is a series of practical results and accomplishments not a list of unrealized dreams and aborted projects. Working with smaller, embedded goals will keep you moving in such a direction. The Laws of Human Nature, Chapter 13 Advance with a Sense of Purpose The Law of Aimlessness And that was The Daily Law for January the 23rd from the book The Daily Laws by Robert Greene. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now, Bishop Robert Barron. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. P. 
peace, right? That's the thing we all want. Everybody in this world, that's what we all want. But you've got to begin with silence. Look, I, I'm kind of a, a driven person. You've got to accomplish something. And do, do, do. Go, go, go. And okay, that's good as far as it goes. But the real joy comes when we can sit quietly, silently, and savor. Do we take the time to do that? To waste time with God. I love that definition of prayer, by the way. How do we hear him? By making silent our own voice, our own minds, our own worries, our own preoccupations. Silence that. And what rises in our heart is the voice of the Lord. And that was Bishop Robert Barron, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Quote, The deeper significance of the ecological crusade lies in the fact that it does expose a profound threat to mankind, though not in the sense its leaders allege. It exposes the ultimate motive of the collectivists, the naked essence of hatred for achievement, which means hatred for reason, for man, for life. In today's drugged orgy of boastful, self-righteous swinishness, the masks are coming down, and you can hear all but explicit confessions of that hatred. Unquote. And that was the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. If you're a Democrat, a right-thinking Democrat, you need to vote Republican and become a Republican. We are the true party of government. We are the ones that love government. The Democrat Party just loves power. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now, Chapter 10 of the 33 Strategies of War. Create a threatening presence. Deterrence strategies. The best way to fight off aggressors is to keep them from attacking you in the first place. To accomplish this, you must create the impression of being more powerful than you are. Build up a reputation. You're a little crazy. Fighting you is not worth it. You take your enemies with you when you lose. Create this reputation and make it credible with a few impressive, impressively violent acts. Uncertainty is sometimes better than overt threat. If your opponents are never sure what messing with you will cost, they will not want to find out. Play on people's natural fears and anxieties to make them think twice. Reverse Intimidation Inevitably in life you will find yourself facing people who are more aggressive than you are. Crafty, ruthless people who are determined to get what they want. Fighting them head on is generally foolish. Fighting is what they are good at and they are unscrupulous to boot. You will probably lose. Trying to fend them off by giving them part of what they are after, or otherwise pleasing or appeasing them, is a recipe for disaster. You are only showing your weakness, inviting more threats and attacks. But giving in completely, surrendering without a fight, hands them the easy victory they crave, and makes you resentful and bitter. It can also become a bad habit the path of least resistance in dealing with difficult situations. Instead of trying to avoid conflict or whining about the injustice of it all, consider an option developed over the centuries by military leaders and strategists to deal with violent and acquisitive neighbors. Reverse intimidation. This art of deterrence rests on three basic facts about war and human nature. First, People are more likely to attack you if they see you as weak or vulnerable. Second, they cannot know for sure that you're weak. They depend on the signs you give out through your behavior, both present and past. Third, they are after easy victories, quick and bloodless. That is why they prey on the vulnerable and weak. Deterrence is simply a matter of turning this dynamic around. 
altering any perception of yourself as weak and naive, and sending the message that battle with you will not be as easy as they had thought. This is generally done by taking some visible action that will confuse aggressors and make them think they have misread you. You may indeed be vulnerable, but they are not sure. You're disguising your weakness and distracting them. Action has much more credibility than mere threatening or fiery words. Hitting back, for instance, even in some small, symbolic way, will show that you mean what you say. With so many other people around who are timid and easy prey, the aggressor will most likely back off and move on to someone else. This form of defensive warfare is infinitely applicable to the battles of daily life. Appeasing people can be as debilitating as fighting them. Deterring them, scaring them out of attacking you or getting in your way, will save you valuable energy and resources. To deter aggressors, you must become adept at deception, manipulating appearances and their perceptions of you. Valuable skills that can be applied to all aspects of daily warfare. And finally, by practicing the art as needed, you will build for yourself a reputation as someone tough, someone worthy of respect and a little fear. The passive-aggressive obstructionists who try to undermine you covertly will also think twice about taking you on. The following are five basic methods of deterrence and reverse intimidation. You can use them all in offensive warfare, but they are particularly effective in defense, for moments when you find yourself vulnerable and under attack. They are culled from the experiences and writings of the greatest masters of the art. Surprise with a bold maneuver. The best way to hide your weakness and to bluff your enemies into giving up their attack is to take some unexpected, bold, risky action. Perhaps they had thought you were vulnerable, and now you are acting as someone who is fearless and confident. This will have two positive effects. First, they will tend to think your move is backed up by something real. They will not imagine you could be foolish enough to do something audacious just for effect. Second, they will start to see strengths and threats in you that they had not imagined. Reverse the threat. If your enemies see you as someone to be pushed around, turn the tables with a sudden move, however small, designed to scare them. Threaten something they value. Hit them where you sense they may be vulnerable and make it hurt. If that infuriates them and makes them attack you, back off a moment and then hit them again when they're not expecting it. Show them you are not afraid of them, and that you are capable of a ruthlessness they had not seen in you. You needn't go too far. Just inflict a little pain. Send a short, threatening message to indicate that you are capable of a lot worse. Seem unpredictable and irrational. In this instance, you do something suggesting a slightly suicidal streak, as if you felt you had nothing to lose. You show that you are ready to take your enemies down with you, destroying their reputations in the process. This is particularly effective with people who have a lot to lose themselves, powerful people with sterling reputations. To defeat you will be costly and perhaps self-destructive. This will make fighting you very unattractive. You are not acting out emotionally. That is a sign of weakness. You are simply hinting that you are a little irrational and that your next move could be almost anything. Crazy opponents are terrifying. No one likes fighting people who are unpredictable and have nothing to lose. Play on people's natural paranoia. Instead of threatening your opponents openly, you take action that is indirect and designed to make them think. This might mean using a go-between to send them a message, to tell some disturbing story about what you are capable of. Or maybe you inadvertently let them spy on you, only to hear something that should give them cause for concern. Making your enemies think they have found out you are plotting a counter move is more effective than telling them so yourself. Make a threat, and you have to live up to it. But making them think you are working treacherously against them is another story. The more veiled menace and uncertainty you generate the more their imaginations will run away with them, and the more dangerous an attack on you will seem. Establish a frightening reputation. This reputation can be for any number of things. Being difficult, stubborn, violent, ruthlessly efficient. 
Build up that image over the years, and people will back off from you, treating you with respect and a little fear. Why obstruct or pick an argument with someone who has shown he will fight to the bitter end? Someone strategic yet ruthless. To create this image, you may, every now and then, have to play a bit rough. But eventually, it will become enough of a deterrent to make those occasions rare. It will be an offensive weapon, scaring people into submission before they even meet you. In any event, you must build your reputation carefully, allowing no inconsistencies. Any holes in this kind of image will make it worthless. By Mao Zedong Injuring all of a man's ten fingers is not as effective as chopping off one. Deterrence and reverse intimidation in practice. 1. In March 1862, less than a year after the start of the American Civil War, the Confederates' situation looked bleak. They had lost a series of important battles, their generals were squabbling, morale was low, and recruits were hard to find. Sensing the South's great weakness, a large Union army under Major General George B. McClellan headed toward the Virginia coast, planning to march from there west to Richmond, the capital of the South. There were enough Confederate troops in the area to hold off McClellan's army for a month or two, but Southern spies reported that Union troops stationed near Washington were about to be transferred to the march on Richmond. If these troops reached McClellan, and they were promised by Abraham Lincoln himself, Richmond would be doomed, and if Richmond fell, the South would have to surrender. The Confederate General Stonewall Jackson was based in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley at the head of 3,600 men, a ragtag group of rebels he had recruited and trained. His job was merely to defend the fertile valley against a Union army in the area, but as he pondered the developing campaign against Richmond, he saw the possibility of something much greater. Jackson had been a classmate of McClellan's at West Point and knew that underneath his brash, talkative exterior, he was basically timid, overly anxious about his career and making any mistakes. McClellan had 90,000 men ready for the march on Richmond, almost double the available Confederate forces. But Jackson knew that this cautious man would wait to fight until his army was overwhelming. He wanted the extra troops that Lincoln had promised him. Lincoln, however, would not release those forces if he saw danger elsewhere. The Shenandoah Valley was to the southwest of Washington. If Jackson could possibly create enough confusion as to what was happening there, he could disrupt the Union plans and perhaps save the South from disaster. On March 22nd, Jackson's spies reported that two-thirds of the Union army stationed in the Shenandoah Valley, under General Nathaniel Banks, was headed east to join McClellan. Soon, an army near Washington, led by General Irvin McDowell, would move toward Richmond as well. Jackson wasted no time. He marched his men fast to the north to attack the Union soldiers still in the valley, near Kernstown. The battle was fierce, and at the end of the day, Jackson's soldiers were forced to retreat. To them, the engagement seemed to have been a defeat, even a disaster. Outnumbered nearly two to one, they had suffered terrible casualties. But Jackson, always a hard man to figure out, seemed oddly satisfied. A few days later, Jackson received the news he had been waiting for. Lincoln had ordered Banks' army to return to the valley, and McDowell's army to stay where it was. The battle at Kernstown had gotten his attention and made him worry. Only a little, but enough. Lincoln did not know what Jackson was up to or how large his army was, but he wanted the Shenandoah Valley pacified no matter what. Only then would he release Banks and McDowell. McClellan was forced to agree with that logic, and although he had the men to march on Richmond right away, he wanted to wait for the reinforcements who would make the attack a sure thing. After Kernstown, Jackson retreated south, away from Banks, and lay low for a few weeks. In early May, thinking that the Shenandoah Valley had been secured, Lincoln sent McDowell toward Richmond, and Banks prepared to join him. Again, Jackson was ready. He marched his army in a completely bizarre fashion, first to the east toward McDowell, then back west into the valley. Not even his own soldiers knew what he was doing. 
Mystified by these strange maneuvers, Lincoln imagined, but wasn't sure, that Jackson was marching to fight McDowell. Once again, he halted McDowell's march south, kept half of Banks' army in the valley, and sent the other half to help McDowell defend himself against Jackson. Suddenly, the Union's plans, which had seemed so perfect, were in disarray, its troops too scattered to support each other. Now Jackson went in for the kill. He linked up with other Confederate divisions in the area, and on May 24th, marched on the Union Army, now divided and dangerously diminished, that remained in the valley. Jackson maneuvered onto its flank and sent it in headlong retreat north to the Potomac River. His pursuit of this army sent a wave of panic through Washington. This now dreaded general, commanding forces that seemed to have doubled in size overnight, was heading straight for the capital. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton telegraphed northern governors to alert them to the threat and to muster troops for the city's defense. Reinforcements quickly arrived to halt the Confederate advance. Meanwhile, Lincoln, determined to eliminate Jackson once and for all, ordered half of McDowell's army west to join in the fight to destroy this pest and the other half to return to Washington to secure the capital. McClellan could only agree. Once again... And Jackson retreated, but by now his plan had worked to perfection. In three months, with only 3,600 men, he had diverted well over 60,000 northern troops, bought the South enough time to coordinate the defense of Richmond, and completely altered the course of the war. And that was the first part of Chapter 10, Create a Threatening Presence from the 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene. Thank you, thank you. Now, the second part of uh, former President Trump's um, speech on the State of the Union in 2018. Young patriots like Preston teach all of us about our civic duty as Americans. And I met Preston a little while ago, and he is something very special that I can tell you. Great future. Thank you very much for all you've done, Preston. Thank you very much. (laughs) Preston's reverence for those who have served our nation reminds us of why we salute our flag, why we put our hands on our hearts for the Pledge of Allegiance, and why we proudly stand for the National Anthem. Americans love their country, and they deserve a government that shows them the same love and loyalty in return. For the last year, we have sought to restore the bonds of trust between our citizens and their government. Working with the Senate, we are appointing judges who will interpret the Constitution as written, including a great new Supreme Court justice and more circuit court judges than any new administration in the history of our country. We are totally defending our Second Amendment and have taken historic actions to protect religious liberty. And we are 
are serving our brave veterans, including giving our veterans choice in their health care decisions. Last year, Congress also passed, and I signed, the landmark VA Accountability Act. Since its passage, my administration has already removed more than 1,500 VA employees who failed to give our veterans the care they deserve. And we are hiring talented people who love our vets as much as we do. And I will not stop until our veterans are properly taken care of, which has been my promise to them from the very beginning of this great journey. All Americans deserve accountability and respect, and that's what we are giving to our wonderful heroes, our veterans. Thank you. So tonight, I call on Congress to empower every cabinet secretary with the authority to reward good workers and to remove federal employees who undermine the public trust or fail the American people. In our drive to make Washington accountable, we have eliminated more regulations in our first year than any administration in the history of our country. We have ended the war on American energy, and we have ended the war on beautiful, clean coal. We are now very proudly an exporter of energy to the world. In Detroit, I halted government mandates that crippled America's great, beautiful auto workers so that we can get Motor City revving its engines again. And that's what's happening. Many car companies are now building and expanding plants in the United States, something we haven't seen for decades. Chrysler is moving a major plant from Mexico to Michigan. Toyota and Mazda are opening up a plant in Alabama, a big one, and we haven't seen this in a long time. It's all coming back. Very soon, auto plants and other plants will be opening up all over our country. This is all news Americans are 
totally unaccustomed to hearing. For many years, companies and jobs were only leaving us. But now they are roaring back. They're coming back. They want to be where the action is. They want to be in the United States of America. That's where they want to be. Exciting progress is happening every single day to speed access to breakthrough cures and affordable generic drugs. Last year, the FDA approved more new and generic drugs and medical devices than ever before in our country's history. We also believe that patients with terminal conditions, terminal illness, should have access to experimental treatment immediately that could potentially save their lives. People who are terminally ill should not have to go from country to country to seek a cure. I want to give them a chance right here at home It's time for Congress to give these wonderful, incredible Americans the right to try. One of my greatest priorities is to reduce the price of prescription drugs. In many other countries, these drugs cost far less than what we pay in the United States, and it's very, very unfair. That is why I've directed my administration to make fixing the injustice of high drug prices one of my top priorities for the year. Prices will come down substantially. Watch. (laughs) America has also finally turned the page on decades of unfair trade deals that sacrificed our prosperity and shipped away our companies, our jobs, and our wealth. Our nation has lost its wealth, but we're getting it back so fast. The era of economic surrender is totally over. From now on, we expect trading relationships to be fair and, very importantly, reciprocal. We will work to fix bad trade deals and negotiate new ones, and they'll be good ones, but they'll be fair. And we will protect American workers and American intellectual property through strong enforcement of our trade rules. As we rebuild our industries, it is also time to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. America is a nation of builders. We built the Empire State Building 
in just one year. Isn't it a disgrace that it can now take 10 years just to get a minor permit approved for the building of a simple road? I am asking both parties to come together to give us safe, fast, reliable, and modern infrastructure that our economy needs and our people deserve. Tonight, I'm calling on Congress to produce a bill that generates at least $1.5 $1.5 trillion for the new infrastructure investment that our country so desperately needs. Every federal dollar should be leveraged by partnering with state and local governments and, where appropriate, tapping into private sector investment to permanently fix the infrastructure deficit. And we can do it. Any bill must also streamline the permitting and approval process, getting it down to no more than two years and perhaps even one. Together, we can reclaim our great building heritage. We will build gleaming new roads, Bridges, highways, railways, and waterways all across our land. And we will do it with American heart, American hands, and American grit. We want every American to know the dignity of a hard day's work. We want every child to be safe in their home at night. And we want every citizen to be proud of this land that we all love so much. We can lift our citizens from welfare to work, from dependence to independence, and from poverty to prosperity. As As tax cuts create new jobs, let's invest in workforce development and let's invest in job training, which we need so badly. Let's open great vocational schools so our future workers can learn a craft and realize their full potential. And let's support working families by supporting paid family leave. As America regains its strength, opportunity must be extended to all citizens. That is why this year we will embark on reforming our prisons to help former inmates who have served their time get a second chance at life. Struggling communities, especially immigrant communities, will also be helped by immigration policies that focus on the best interests of American workers and American families. For decades, open borders have allowed drugs and gangs to pour into our most vulnerable communities. 
They've allowed millions of low-wage workers to compete for jobs and wages against the poorest Americans. Most tragically, they have caused the loss of many innocent lives. Here tonight are two fathers and two mothers, Evelyn Rodriguez, Freddie Cuevas, Elizabeth Alvarado, and Robert Mickens. Their two teenage daughters, Kayla Cuevas and Nisa Mickens, were close friends on Long Island. But in September 2016, on the eve of Nisa's 16th birthday, such a happy time it should have been, neither of them came home. These two precious girls were brutally murdered while walking together in their hometown. Six members of the savage MS-13 gang have been charged with Kayla and Nisa's murders. Many of these gang members took advantage of glaring loopholes in our laws to enter the country as illegal, unaccompanied, alien minors and wound up in Kayla and Nisa's high school. Evelyn, Elizabeth, Freddie, and Robert, tonight everyone in this chamber is praying for you. Everyone in America is grieving for you. Please stand. Thank you very much. And that was uh, former President Donald Trump's 2018 State of the Union Address. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States. Today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you to be honest, smart, and beautiful, and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.